So Brad, you let me know when you think we've uh, we've reached. Uh... Kind of, we've kind of slowed down. Um, oh, there's another one. Let's give it like another thirty seconds or so, and then sure. and we should be able to go. So folks, as we uh, wait to officially get started, uh, why don't you let us know in the chat where you're joining us from? So don't feel obligated, but if you'd like to uh, let us know where you're joining us from, feel free to type it into the chat. Nice. That's what I love about these, get people from across the country. You really need Not just Massachusetts. Right. All right, I think we've, we've steadied off. So why don't you go ahead and get us started, Robert. Great, thank you so much, Brad. Uh, so folks, I'm gonna speak for approximately three or four minutes and then we'll get to the good stuff. Uh, so good evening and thanks for being with us for the next hour to hear from author and astronaut Terry Virts in conversation with moderator J. Kelly Beatty. Uh, my name is Robert Hayes. I'm the community outreach librarian and head of technical services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, I'd like to make a few quick points before introducing Kelly and uh, Colonel Verts. Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone behind the scenes for making this event possible. This is a collaboration between six North of Boston libraries. I'd like to thank Stephanie from Andover, Lizzie and Sharon from Billerica, Lynn from North Reading, Rebecca from Woburn, and Charlotte, Erin, Emily, and Brad from Wilmington. I'd also like to thank uh, Deanna from Workman Publishers and Jane from Wellesley Books. Uh, second, uh, know that this event is part of a series of virtual events from best-selling authors. Uh, our next virtual author visit is this coming Friday, September 25th at seven o'clock. Uh, we'll be hosting Eleanor Herman, whose latest book is called Sex with Presidents, the ins and outs of love and lust in the White House. <laughs> Uh, Eleanor has hosted Lost Worlds for the History Channel, uh, The Madness of Henry VIII for the National Geographic Channel, and is now filming her second season of America Fact vs. Fiction for the American Heroes Channel. And I'll make sure to include a link to uh, register for her event uh, down in the chat. Uh, third, I just know that this event is uh, currently being live streamed on the Wilmington Memorial Library's Facebook page. Uh, feel free to give it a like and a share. Uh, fourth, uh, you'll all be receiving a feedback survey shortly after this event ends. It might be tomorrow. Uh, please let us know what you thought of tonight's event and what you'd like to see for future events. Uh, also in the feedback survey will be a link to purchase an autographed copy of Colonel Vert's latest book uh, from Wellesley Books, our, our bookstore partner, who will uh, gladly ship it to you. And then finally, to set expectations, I anticipate this event will last approximately an hour. Uh, Colonel Verts has a short slideshow he's going to share. Uh, Kelly will interview Colonel Verts for approximately 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Very important, right here. You must type your questions into the Q&A. So comments go in the comments box, and the questions go into the Q&A box and uh, Brad uh, and I will be monitoring both and uh, Kelly will be keeping an eye on the Q&A box. Uh, so at this point, I'm gonna introduce Kelly and then Kelly will introduce Colonel Verts. Uh, so Jay Kelly Beatty is senior editor for Sky and Telescope Magazine, specializing in planetary science and space exploration. Uh, Kelly conceived and edited the new solar system, which considered a standard reference among planetary scientists and his work has been honored twice by the Division for Planetary Sciences of the American Astronomical Society. So um, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Kelly for joining us here tonight. And Kelly, you can take it away and you can start by introducing Colonel Verts. So thanks so thank, much. Thank you, Robert. And, and you left out my, my greatest accolade, which is I'm, I've spoken a couple of times at the Tewksbury Public Library. So uh, I, you know, some of the people who are here perhaps remember those. I, I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I've been a space junkie my whole life, and uh, this is this is going to be a lot of fun for all of us tonight. So thank you for being here. So let me introduce, uh, before we get going here, uh, Colonel Terry Verts, who is um, uh, now no longer an astronaut. He retired in, in 2016, but 
by then he had been in the astronaut corps for uh, 16 years. He joined in the year 2000 at the age of 33. Of course, he had a life before then. Uh, he, he went the pilot route. He went to the Air Force Academy and Embry-Riddle University um, and, and uh, spent some time as an experimental test pilot at Air Force, Edwards Air Force Base out in the California desert uh, before becoming uh, selected as an astronaut in the year 2000. Uh, he was a member of the the class every astronaut class has a name this one has was named the bugs as i right. and maybe you can explain that after a while but um you know he he left the astronaut car, corps in 2016 and uh by then he had logged two missions very different missions i might add one and i'm sure you'll talk about them one was uh, as uh one of the the commander of uh, pilot of the space shuttle uh, probably the pilot right um, pilot, yep. and and uh, that's the number two seat and that was a relatively short mission. And then he spent uh, roughly 200 days uh, aboard the International Space Station and did a stint as its commander. Uh, that was in, in uh, 2014 and 2015. So uh, he's, he's got a wide variety of experiences. He's flown 40 different kinds of jets and we'll tap into all of that uh, in, in the coming hours. So uh, Colonel Vertz, thank you for coming and, and welcome and, and congratulations on your book. Well, thanks for having me here. This is exciting. I wish I was there in person. I miss uh, Massachusetts, especially this time of year. So um, I, I think, you know, a lot of people have a notion of what it's like to be in, in space. They've, I suspect that pretty much everyone here has followed the space program at some level. Uh, this, however, is going to be different because they'll have a one-on-one -on -one chance to find out from you what it's like. And I, and I think that you know, you you have, uh, as I uh, understand, you've, you've prepared a sort of like a little snapshot, a few snapshots from space for us to kind of set the mood. Yeah, so I, I made a little presentation. Let me call it up. And um, it, as you meant, so the book that I wrote, just a real quick overview, is really a collection of essays. There's 51 short chapters and you can read them in any, you know, order. Uh, they're it's supposed to be fun. There you go. Um, <laughs> it's it's supposed to be a fun book. You know, it's for anybody. It's not for only space nerds. You don't have to be an expert to read it. It's something that uh, I hope my goal in writing it was to make you laugh and say, wow. And so uh, that's kind of the background on what the book was meant to be. And I'm going to click share screen and show a few pictures that I have um, that can talk through a couple of the chapters. So how is that? Can you see what I'm sh sh screen sharing right now? Yes, looks great. So, okay, so that's the kind of the background of what the book is. Um, the no astronaut book goes without a chapter on launch, and launch is just an unbelievable experience. I my first flight was on Endeavor on the space shuttle Endeavor, and I had been a fighter pilot and test pilot, like like you were saying. You know, I, I thought I had done some stuff, and when you hear those engines light up. It's a sound that I've never heard before. The acceleration, you're on this big, you know, four and a half million pound vehicle. There's six or seven million pounds of thrust. It was an amazing experience. And, uh, but the, the chapters that I wrote are not only about that, it's about how to get in the spacesuit because that spacesuit is not an easy thing to do. Um, what it's like to look out the window while you're go rocketing into orbit. Uh, there's a funny chapter on the red button that maybe we can talk about later. There's a guy with a red button there at the Kennedy Space Center. <laughs> so launch was definitely a part of the book, um, as is doing spacewalks. You'd expect that. These are some of the chapters you'd expect. There's also other chapters, hopefully, you wouldn't expect. Um, but I also talk about getting into this spacesuit because this is not an easy thing to put on. You know, in the space movies, they, they just jump in their spacesuits and they go out the hatch. And I wish somebody would invent that. That would make life a lot easier. Um, you know, the Iron Man suit where you push a button and your, you know, covers you up in your spacesuit. That's not how it works. Um, this thing is about three or 400 pounds of mass. It's a really bulky thing. It has metal rings for your joints. So your arms kind of move like this. They don't move, you know, you can't pitch. <laughs> this would be a bad thing for pitchers. In fact, one of the main problems we have are torn scapulas. Your your shoulder ligaments tend to get ripped and stuff as an astronaut. There's a real like medical problem in training because these metal things restrict your motion. And if you try and move and you can't, you know, rip. Um, I talk about being busy 99.9% .9 of the time and then 
turning around and seeing this view of like creation, like uh, humans aren't meant to see this. And then you have to get back to work. So the spacewalking chapters are, were pretty fun. Um, this is one, this is one of my favorite pictures of me in space. It's, I've got an IMAX camera and, and I was helping to film a beautiful planet, uh, which is an IMAX movie. Actually, Disney is now streaming them on Hulu. So that's um, a pretty cool if you're stuck at home in quarantine and, and you wanna watch some good movies. Uh, I, there are several IMAX films you can watch on Hulu. Um, but Beautiful Planet was the last one that Tony Myers made. Uh, she was my director. She had been making these films since Space Shuttle Columbia in 1981. And in my humble opinion, she saved her best for last. And I had the honor of, of helping to make this movie while I was in space. And uh, now I've kind of moved on to film and TV. That's what I'm wanting to do with my life. And this is uh, this was like the catalyst for that. And Tony really showed me how to do that. She was awesome. Um, there's a chapter on learning to be a doctor. <laughs> so uh, that was something that I loved. I just fell in love with it. I got to work at the local Houston hospital for a week. Um, sewing people up, uh, bandaging their burns. Uh, this one poor lady had her leg was snapped in half and the, they were tr trying to put it back in place and I was holding her hand. Anyway, I got to deal with all kinds of medical problems, which sounds kind of morbid, but when you're in training, it was, it was really interesting. And I kind of realized in a different life, I would love to have been a doctor. Um, in fact, while I was doing my training, I went to Barnes and Noble and and grabbed one of those MCAT study guides and I flipped through it for about five minutes and then put it back on the shelf and realized that that time had passed. <laughs> I was not gonna be going to medical school after my astronaut career. Um, although we have had that. I know of one man who did that and another guy wanted to do that. So it is something that we get the bug. Uh, survival training I write about, which is something you may not expect, but, um, and I had done that in the Air Force in case I ever had to eject over enemy territory or had was be a prisoner of war, uh, which you'd expect. And I thought I was 18 years old at the Air Force Academy. I thought I was finished with that. Well, then I did it again with the French Air Force when I did an exchange with them. And then I did it again with the Navy when I came to NASA. And then I did it again with the Russians for winter survival. And then I did it again for, with the Russians for water survival. And then we did this program called NOLS, uh, which is kind of a survival training for astronauts. They try and make you as miserable as possible so that when you're in space and you're facing tough situations, you can handle it. So this chapter, the original chapter was probably twice as long. I had to cut out a lot. I think it was a 15,000 word chapter and I had to cut it down to 7,500. Most of my chapters are like a thousand words or maybe two or 3,000. They're pretty short. You can read them in, if you're a reader, you can read each chapter in a couple minutes probably. Um, but this chapter was really long because of all the different survival tr training that I've done. I write a chapter about flying jets. Uh, this is a NASA T-38. It's the most important training we do. Um, it is space flight readiness training is what we call it. And it's the closest you can get to space flight on earth. Not because of the stick and rudder skills of how to land a T-38, but because of the mental skills of having to stay ahead of the jet. Uh, we call it situational awareness. And doing all that while like your butt is on the line. You, you might die. If you're flying a supersonic jet, there's not a hundred percent chance that you're going to land. So you have to emotionally get ready to be able to operate and do things while being under that threat of, of you know, danger. Um, one of the things and I talked about this, in my first national geographic book was getting to know the earth by color. Uh, and in this book, of course I write about it, which is something that unexpected, but um, it was something that happened. And so now I know Canada and Russia and probably Massachusetts, they're often white um, because of snow and, and ice. Uh, the Bahamas are just unbelievable. You can see the blue turquoise there. Australia is red. I remember the one time the whole space station got flooded with red and I was like, what is going on? I had just installed the cupola and I just opened all the windows for the first time. And I looked out the windows and there was the outback of Australia going by. Um, the jungle can be, can be black. And this is the Congo is just really, really, really dark. It's amazing how dark it is. Um, and this is the Southern lights, actually the Aurora Australis. Um, but the colors there are gorgeous. This is just a quick home movie that I made, but uh, if you watch beautiful planet, there's some really spectacular, um, 
uh, Aurora shots in that. Uh, I, I won't talk too much about this. You wanted to talk about this chapter, <laughs> but yes, I had to learn how to cut women's hair. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. It was a three person job. Uh, I did the cutting and Anton did the vacuuming. He was, he was, flo- he was hovering overhead with the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> well, well, let's, let's, let's pause here if you want okay. and expand yeah. on this because it's the visual that tells the story, <laughs> right? You, you, uh, you, you found yourself uh, in the presence of a sort of a, a star from Italy. Oh yeah. Look, American astronauts are a dime a dozen. I would challenge you to name anybody not named Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin. You know, I would challenge the average American to name one and they might come up with one, you know, so we're a dime a dozen in America, but in Italy, Samantha was the first ever Italian woman. um, And she was a rock star. She was on national TV every night and she's wonderful. She, she doesn't want attention. She's like engineer pilot she's a in the italian air force she's a pilot also and you know she, that fame wasn't her thing but she but she's italian so she wanted to look good so uh before we launched she, she wouldn't give me permission to launch until i went with her to her hairdresser here in houston and i spent two and a half hours learning how to cut women's hair and uh you got to read the book it was it was quite an experience something i never thought i'd have to do and something that was freaking nerve wracking that was very I, I believe you called it the most stressful thing you ever had to do <laughs> that's because it was yes <laughs> it was very stressful i mean look anton's hair takes about 30 seconds to cut my hair look at my hair there it takes about you put the number two attachment on stick the vacuum cleaner in the back and 30 seconds later i got my hair cut not with samantha or most there's lots of women that fly in space usually they just let their hair grow long and they put them in a ponytail So she's not the first woman that has had to deal with hair, but the other ones usually just let it grow and put it in a ponytail. But she needed the special, you know, special haircut. So hopefully she seemed, she was very happy. Uh, We did that twice and um, it was good. And so um, are there other pictures here? Oh, sorry. No, let me stop. Let me stop my uh, screen sharing. (laughs) There we go. All right. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, you, you make a point that um, you can dive into this book anywhere and all of the chapters yeah. are, are engaging. They're, they're all a lot of fun. Uh, I haven't read every one of them yet, but I read a few. And let me, let me just start right there. This is surely not the first book about being in space written by a former astronaut. And so um, uh, how do you find your way in that crowd? What, yeah. what did you do to make this special? Well, um, many of them come in the form of a memoir, right? There's, it seems like every astronaut has a memoir. So I did not, this is not, it, there are stories about me, of course, but this is not like my life story. I, I wanted to organize it in a way that would be fun and digestible and you could read it at the pool, read it at the beach put it on your nightstand and, you know, read a chapter at night and fall asleep um, or listen to me. It's read by the author for the uh, audiobook. So if you want to listen to me, tell the stories, you can do that too. Um, so I, I think the way it's organized is different. And also you said every astronaut's written a book. Um, I kind of think not very many, if any, have actually written the book. I think most guys use ghost, ghost authors. And uh, I, I didn't, I wrote it myself and I, I was probably the least likely to write a book in high school. Um, I got C's in English. I tortured my poor English teachers. Ugh, I was awful. And now I'm helping my son. He's in college. He sends me these essays. Hey, dad, help me out. And I'm like, oh my God, don't you know how to write? Um, and I was the same way when I was a kid. So, but as I grew up, I realized that it was communication that was really important. You're from the astronomy community. That's right. Mo- most astronomers want to just sit in front of their computer and look at numbers and talk, you know, argue with other astronomers about minutia, right? But the reality is in order to communicate like you do, that's how you that's how you touch people. That's how you affect people. Um, and we, we I, I, hopefully you'll get there. We, I was reading your stuff when I was a kid, which is the coolest story when we were talking about this. Do yeah. you want to talk about that? Well, I, I've been on the staff of Sky and Telescope since 1974. Right. And uh, five years after joining the staff, this this NASA mission called Voyager happened that went by first Jupiter and Saturn and eventually Uranus and Neptune. And, and that was my beat. And so I wrote all of the stories in Sky and Telescope re- discussing the Voyager results. And I read all of them. I remember um, 
every week. I, I subscribe to Sky and Telescope and Astronomy, and I would like walk out to my mailbox every day, especially in the summertime when I was home with nothing else to do. Because back then there wasn't anything to do. You just sat around in the house bored. But uh, uh, and I'd get it, and I would just devour it, and you know immediately. So that is so cool that when I was a kid, I was reading the articles that you were writing about Voyager, and I just made a short film uh, that I just found out is a finalist in this film festival that we entered it in about space photography. And a big part of it is the Voyager mission. And it's about how that photography like shaped our consciousness. The, like humanity's collective consciousness is different because of the images we got from space. And guys like Carl Sagan and now Neil deGrasse Tyson and Brian Cox in the UK. These, right. They're smart guys, but they can communicate, which is a rare combination right it's normally just the left brain that's not the right brain or only the right brain not the left brain but when you can do both then you can impact a lot more people than if you just have your little obscure experiment on the side well, not that those those are important but you have to have those but you know and until it's communicated no one knows about it well, I'm grateful that you waited by your mailbox for my my stories to arrive. Um, I did, which which kind of brings me to my my first question. There must have come a point in your life, uh, you were you were born in in Maryland and and raised in Maryland in Columbia, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you went to Oakland, uh, <coughs> Oakland Mills Oakland Hills High School. Yep. When did the first inkling occur to you that someday I'd like to be an astronaut? So. It was when I was in kindergarten, I think it was the first book I ever read. It was a, a, a reader book, like, you know, one line per page. I'm flipping the pages and it was about Apollo. And I can still remember this. It was like a black, in my mind, it was a black and white book. And these guys went to the moon and it was just so cool. My eyes were big and I was hooked for life, literally. And um, the... Uh, growing up, you know, on my walls right now, I've got pictures that I took in space on my walls here. Um, but I had posters of M31 and M42, you know, the nebulas and galaxies. I had a space shuttle poster and I had an F-16 poster. I had the old red, white, and blue, the original 1974 F-16. And it was so cool because I grew up and I flew F-16s and then I flew the space shuttle. And those are posters I had as a little kid on my wall. So you spent time uh, as an Air Force pilot and, and as an experimental pilot. What, in your mind, is more dangerous, being an experimental test pilot or an astronaut? Well, astronaut, for sure. Because, you know, thankfully, knock on wood, we, we've had a, a, a decent safety record. But, you know, on the space shuttle, we lost two crews out of 135, which are pretty bad odds. I mean, that's approaching you know, World War II pilot kind of odds. Um, and who knows about the future? I mean, these, you know, we're kind of barreling full speed ahead and let's hope that everything's safe. But, you know, first of all, lots of stuff has to work perfectly. Um, they used to say the space shuttle had over 5 million parts. So, you know, if it was 99 point whatever percent uh, effective, you'd have hundreds of malfunctions. Um, and so, it, you know, space flight is a dangerous business. Unfortunately, it's also run by humans who are not perfect and they make mistakes and some really bad decisions sometimes. I just, I'm just watched the Challenger documentary. In fact, I'm teaching a class at Harvard Business School this weekend about Challenger and Columbia um, as a guest lecturer there. And so not only does all the physical stuff have to work, but the people have to be smart and make the good decisions. And so, um, you know, there's some danger there for sure. Right. Now you, you, you mentioned at the top that you wanted people to come away from the book with a wow experience. And <laughs> right. you use that word a lot in the chapter having to do with launch. It was a wow experience for you. Wow this and right. wow that. Yeah. But, you, but in reading between the lines, um, it's, it's a fairly violent uh, experience. <laughs> you want to describe it a little bit? Yeah, so actually I launched on the space shuttle and on the Soyuz, and they're very different rides. Um, Liquid-fueled rockets are pretty smooth. There's not a lot of vibration, but solid rocket fuel is really rough. There's a lot of vibration. In fact, yeah, there's just a lot of vibration. So the space shuttle in the first stage had those two big white strap-on rockets. I've got a model up there. 
And the first two minutes, man, it was like someone grabbed you by the shirt and is just shaking you. Um, and you're smashed back in your seat because you jump off the pad at a little less than two G's, maybe one and a half, two G's. And then it slowly builds up to almost three G's. And then those rockets pop off and you're back to one G. And then it slowly builds up to three G's. So three G's is three times your weight. So lay on your back and have two or three of your best friends lay on top of you. And that's what it, you're, I mean, you're smashed down. The Soyuz, I think gets up to four G's during SN. I mean, that's a ICBM. It's an old Soviet intercontinental ballistic missile. And uh, they didn't build those things to like be majestic and kind of sit there in the sky and make noise and fire for everybody to watch and cheer. They built those things to get and up and get moving. <laughs> and that's what they do. Uh, so they were a little bit different experiences, but sound, noise, vibration. In the shuttle, I had a window. I was like the co-pilot in an airliner. So I had, I could see night turned into day. We go flying through these clouds. There was a couple of cloud decks. I could see it coming and I was like, I closed my eyes, boom. There's so many stories. You have to read the chapter. I could, I could go on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'll definitely do that. Um, you, you hold the record, as I understand it, for having taken the most pictures in space. And uh, I want you just to tell us a little bit about that, but weave into that, you know, how much free time do you have on your own? Or, or are you trying, are you working all the time pretty much? Well, you know, for my long duration, for the shuttle mission, I worked all the time. I, I woke up and ran until 18 hours later, you know, I fell asleep and then I did the same thing the next day. On my 200 day flight on the long duration station mission, um, it was like, you'd start the day at 7.30, you'd finish roughly at seven at night. And so you had a couple hours at night, but then you had to make yourself dinner. Then you had to get ready for the next day. Um, I always had a pocket full of little flashcards from the camera that I'd have to download. Uh, we had Picasa, the Google program. That was our right. photography program. So I would get on Picasa and, you know, hit, I'm feeling lucky, you know, the auto button and, um, make time lapses. The, the Aurora time lapse is one that I made that in space. I haven't had time since then to do a proper one. Um, so it was a pretty busy time. And I would always try and have dinner with the Russians. I'd float down to the Russian segment, put all my food in a Ziploc and just talk with those guys. And I told you I was making a beautiful planet. Right. And so NASA didn't give me any time to make that. I literally had one hour on my schedule for uh, equipment familiarization. So they scheduled an hour for me to go around, get the cameras out and just remind myself how they work. Cause it had been months since I'd seen them. And other than that, I, I didn't film the whole movie. My crewmates helped, but I filmed like the, a lot of it to say the least. And that was all done in my spare time. So you didn't work 24 seven, but I was busy 24 seven. I was never bored. If you got sick, did you ever have sick days? That was, that, uh, actually, that was that, one of the questions that's been asked by the, our audience. I have to say, I have never been asked that question before. That's amazing. I've been doing this for a few years and to ask me a question I've never been asked is a hard, that's tough. I can't believe that. Wow. Well, Steve Lola, you have stumped the astronaut. That is impressive. Well, I'm not stumped, I, we didn't, I'm, you know, but the, the, there's good and bad. Um, yeah. We didn't get sick days, but we didn't get sick either. So that was glasses half full. <laughs> right, right. And and speaking of sick uh, sickness, uh, it's it's often the case that when you get into space, uh, you being in that microgravity, that weightless condition, uh, your body has a hard time adjusting to it. Um, I, I so a, let's carry this through a couple of, of questions. One of the ways you train for that. Or, or used to train for that was on a special NASA airplane, um, a KC-135 nicknamed the Vomit Comet that mm -hmm. would do these parabolas over the offshore from Houston that mm -hmm. would give you about 20 or 25 seconds of, of weightlessness. I actually right. flew on the Vomit Comet a couple of times. Oh, cool. And, and I was disappointed to learn in your book that it doesn't exist anymore. It doesn't, unfortunately. It, I am disappointed too, it's very sad. Yeah, the chapter, I'm so proud of the name of that chapter. It's called The Vomit Comet, Your First Taste of Weightlessness. Yes. Um, uh, so that um, experience was amazing. Uh, my, my advice, if, if you, you can pay money to a company called Zero G, they have old 727, I think, and you can, you can do this for a couple thousand dollars. 
If you do it, take the medicine. That's my advice. Right. They give you this motion sickness medicine. I've done it both with and without. There's a funny story in there. Um, it's a lot more fun with. That's my right. only advice. Right, right, right. And and so does does the experience that you had in that weightless training uh, give you any indication as to how your body's going to react once you actually no. get into orbit? No. I, I honestly, Kelly, I don't think it's possible. I mean, I think fighter pilots and, you know, cause you're used to maneuvering and being disoriented. I think that helps a little bit, but I've heard the NASA doctors also say there's no predictor of who's going to get sick and who won't. Mm -hmm. There's no training for it. The Russians have this, one of those crazy 1960s things at their crew quarters uh, in Baikonur and you can go in it and they'll spin you around, you know, for a few minutes in the days leading up to launch. Cause they think, you know, you're adjusting yourself and you're training. Um, our doctor said that that doesn't do anything, it, but you know, it's a placebo. Maybe it makes you feel better. I did it a couple of times and I'm like, man, this sucks. And I had been in space and I'm like, this isn't space. So I don't think, I don't think you can train for it. I think you get into space, you're weightless first few seconds and minutes, you're fine. And then after that, your brain is just going, what in the heck just happened? Mm. Um, cause we got three different systems. We have a visual, your balance system has three inputs. So you, I can look and I know that the top of my house is that way and the floor is over there. So that is telling my brain which way is up and down. You have a somatosensory where you can feel up and down. So my butt, I can tell that I'm sitting on a chair. So it knows that down is that way. Um, and in space, you have the visual, but you don't have that force. And then you have the inner ear system, the neurovestibular system. And that um, is basically the same thing as a rate gyro assembly that... Uh, fly-by-wire F-16 has, the space shuttle has. It can tell if you're pitching up, if you're yawing, or if you're rolling. Our body has the same exact thing. Um, and that doesn't work in space. So two of your three inputs don't work in space. And your brain is just going, all right, these signals are coming in, what's happening? It took me about two days and then it was a light switch. It was literally like, ah, I'm fine. You know, my brain figured it out. And then four or five years later, I went back to space and I was fine. Like from day one, the neurons had been rewired and it, the brain knew what was happening. It didn't freak out the second time. Thankfully. But, be, but being in orbit is, is not uh, healthy for the human body. Uh, and you have to do a lot to keep yourself from breaking down. You want to describe you some, of the, some of the activities that you have to yep. do? Absolutely. So there's a chapter or two about that in there. So the most basic problem is just turning into a jellyfish. Cause like right now I'm exercising just to sit up requires my bones and my muscles to work. And you never have to do that ever. And so there's, it's a linear, it's about a percent and a half a month of bone density that you lose. The Russians discovered that on the space station mirror. So NASA came up with this exercise protocol. They give us two and a half hours a day. We have a workout machine, a treadmill and a bike. And I did all of those religiously. Um, did the weightlifting, which is, it uses a cylinder to generate force. There's no actually weight. Um, and I ran on the treadmill, which the pounding of the treadmill, they say is the most important thing. You wear a shoulder pads and bungees to hold you down. So otherwise you just go flying off. Um, and I did the exercise, the bike exercise for my cardiovascular. And when I came back after 200 days, I had lost 0.0% .0 of my bone density. Hmm. And, and I took vitamin D that we would get these little Ziploc bags with little white vitamin D pills. So between exercising and taking vitamin D, my bones were fine. Right. And I was, I was pretty strong. You know, I was like 90% what I was before I left. I did 20 pull-ups the week I got back. My, my muscles were, were strong too. So and, if you do what they say, and if you do your rehab, when you get back, you, you won't be perfect. You'll have some degradation, but you'll be in pretty good shape. So you, uh, you mentioned, you write in the book that uh, you, you're tested extensively before your flight and afterward, the vestibular balance and so forth. And you were uh, something of a remarkable specimen when you got back in that you readjusted to gravity and, and regained your balance much faster uh, than, than you would have been expected. And I think you say that in the book that apparently my body was made for space. Yeah, I was very fortunate. My my body, like you said, so I lost 0% of my bone density, which kind of shocked everybody, the doctors and me. And then they did this balance test where they put you in this kind of 
fun house box. You, you can't see anything. And then they pull the rug out from under you and they, they, they jerk you around and they measure how long it takes your body to readjust. And my score after 200 days in space, a week after landing was better than it had been before launch, which that blew me away. But I, you know, it's a number, it was what it was. So I was very lucky in that sense. The one thing that you can't control at all is radiation. Mm -hmm. And the radiation that happens in space is actually doesn't exist on earth, right? Because we have air and these super high energy particles, if they hit an air molecule would degrade into, into less, lesser energy particles. So um, that's the one thing. And of course, radiation can lead to cancer. Um, the good news is it's astronauts aren't, you know, dropping like flies. Right. Um, but but you do have a lifetime radiation exposure limit, right? We do. Yeah. They, they say we're only allowed to be 3% more likely to die. So they, they basically irradiate us until we get to the 3% more likely to die. And then they don't let you fly in space anymore. Hmm. But that number is, it's based on a dosimeter. So you have a little mini smaller than a cell phone size thing. I kept it in my pocket with me the whole time. It's a, it's like a piece of plastic and they can measure how much damage it has from the radiation. Um, but, you know, I think quantifying radiation as a number is like 8.9. That's a little bit disingenuous because there's low energy radiation and there's really high energy radiation and there's stuff that just doesn't exist on earth unless there's a nuclear bomb going off. And, um, so it's not just a quantity thing. It's also a quality thing. What types of radiation are you getting? And NASA doesn't measure you before and after. It, it, it shocked me to my core how little research is done on the human side of radiation. They just don't, they just don't know. They don't test it. So uh, there, there's still a, definitely an unknown when it comes to that. Now, now your long duration mission on, uh, on the station was, as I look at the dates here, um, uh, 2014, 15, that was near the sun's, sun's maximum of its activity cycle, which uh, solar storms and flares are, are happening all the time. What, what happens in the case of an, an energetic solar event that uh, those particles, they're relativistic particles, they can go through the space station walls. What do you do? Oh, yeah. how, do you, how do you shelter in place? <clears throat> there is a, we monitor space weather and if there's a really bad, storm. In fact, one time I was Capcom and we had a spacewalk coming up and we almost canceled the spacewalk uh, because of the solar activity. So that's an important thing. In the crew quarters where you sleep, there are these little foam bricks that are supposed to protect us from radiation. Um, so you could, if they called a shelter in place, you could potentially go in there because it's supposed to be a little bit better. Uh, water is actually the best protection and we have something called a water wall. In fact, my IMAX cameras, uh, I would keep them in there uh, to protect the chips because the camera chips are very sensitive to radiation. Whenever you look at video from the space station, there's all these cameras on the inside of the station. So if you just look at archival footage uh, or night pictures, especially, you'll see a lot of dead pixels, these little white dots. And if they're not moving, you know, if all the stars are going by and there's a bunch of dots not moving, you know that that camera's been up there for probably a year or more and the radiation has really damaged the chip. Wow. Um, I, I actually had this experience and you, you might've noticed in one of the chapters I talk about it, of seeing white flashes. Mm -hmm. um, and I talk about the first time I saw it was on my fifth night in space. I was going to bed, I closed my eyes and that's it. That's a white, that's what the Apollo guys were right. talking about. Like I saw right. it. And as you know, there, the earth has a magnetic field and when this solar uh, flare happens or a coronal mass ejection, there's all these electrons that get shot out into the, into the solar system and the sun's magnetic, if the sun's magnetic field bends it and it throws a perfect strike curveball that hits earth, um, our magnetic field captures it and just stores it there. And there's a place, and, and as it gets, as they flow down to the north and south magnetic poles, that's the aurora, Borealis and Australis. But there's a place over the South Atlantic called the South Atlantic Anomaly. And I actually just did a, a show for the BBC. They're making a documentary about this called Anomaly um, that the Earth's magnetic field dips and our space station orbit goes right through this dip. And so you, we fly through all this extra radiation sometimes. Right. Um, and whenever I would see these flashes, I started to look 
I would look on my laptop, I'd open up the laptop and there's a world map and I'd look at the map and it turned out that we were always over the South Atlantic anomaly when I was seeing these flashes. Yeah, so a, place a, to, thing. a place to avoid for sure. <laughs> when you're in space, yeah. <laughs> now, um, one of the, speaking of eyesight and the flashes, uh, one of the things that's emerged in the last few years is that when you're in space, the, the weightless conditions distorts your eyeballs in, in ways that are not entirely recoverable. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, so one of the things that happens when you see astronauts in space, our faces are puffy. It's like um, it's like laying on your laying on your back with your head down, like two degrees or five degrees. So your blood kind of flows to your head, and one of the implications of that is that the intraocular pressure, the, just the pressure in your eyeball, goes up. And you know, doctors are trying to figure out uh, is that bad long term because you have this optic nerve back there that is why you can see. So is it bad to just squeeze the optic nerve for six months or a year or whatever? Um, and the answer is we're not sure. There's a lot of factors that go into this. A few astronauts have reported eyesight problems. So when I was there, we studied everything from the carbon dioxide level, which might impact your eyesight, um, to I was scanning my eyeball with this infrared camera, with this big laser scanner device called OCT. Um, with visual images, I was doing uh, ultrasound on my brain and on my heart um, and on my eyeball to look at the blood flow. So there's a lot of medical studies going on. The good news is, you know, the vast majority of guys go in space, your eyesight gets farther distance. So your distant vision gets better and your near vision, you know, you can't, um, you can't do this. Right. You gotta do that, but guess what? We're not 20 years old either. So a lot, a lot of us are doing that anyway, right? Yeah. How and so, many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. So, so um, <clears throat> let's get to some of the fun stuff. Uh, you did some spacewalks, and yeah. that has to be, in the minds of many, the, the ultimate thrill experience. Can you walk us, so to speak, through a spacewalk? And what's it like to be just immersed in space? <clears throat> so... <clears throat> the thing to know about spacewalks is 99% of it is work and it's physically demanding work. That suit is so big and bulky and it's pressurized. So just to move is a lot of work and you're moving with your hands. So you're squeezing your gloves and you're in the suit for probably nine hours. So it is a workout. That's the first thing to know. Uh, the second thing to know is it's dangerous outside. Like if you get a leak, you might die. Um, if you have water in your suit, you might, which I did, and I talked about that in one of the chapters. Um, if a micrometeorite or a piece of debris hits you, you might die. So you don't, you want to minimize the amount of time you're outside. So I've never felt more on the clock than I did during those, you know, six and a half hour long spacewalks. I did three of them because I, you just don't want to waste time. I took most pictures ever of anybody, and I had a camera wedged in my chest pack, and on each of my spacewalks, I. I did this like 10 or 20 times. I barely had time to take any pictures just because I felt so on the clock. I would rather have gone out and taken hours of pictures. I did take a lot of GoPro video. So that's the other thing to know. And then, like I said, 99% of its work, every once in a while I would stop and look at, it It felt like I was like, this is what God sees when he makes mm. the universe and humans should not be seeing this. And then I had to get back to work because I got to plug in this cable. Um, so that's, th those are just a few of the things. The spacewalk chapter, my first book was really long. We had to cut it down. In this book, there's several of them. There, there's just so much material there. We, we definitely had to cut that down to fit in the book. And, and, uh, and, and I, I won't, I won't, don't want to get into it here, but, but the suits can be very challenging because they don't, they don't custom fit the suits for you or, the, or uh, and you don't necessarily get something that's easy to put on and take off. Well, you're guaranteed to get something that's not easy to take off on and put on. Yeah, for sure. There, there's a whole chapter about that. <laughs> yeah. And that, we'll just leave that for the reader for later. For later. But um, uh, you, you mentioned uh, your Russian colleagues. Did you have to learn Russian to be on the space station? Yeah. Or? Konyashna. Konyashna. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was speaking Russian today uh, with a neighbor. Um, uh, one of our former translators in Star City actually lives right next to me. Um, and I was talking to Gennady Padalka, who I was in space with right. uh, two days ago, I think. Uh, he has the most time of anybody in space. He's been in space 879 days. 
on five missions. So almost, you know, two and a half years, it's crazy. crazy. Um, but you know, the Soyuz is all in Russian. The radio comm is all in Russian. Your crewmates are in Russian. Half this terror, probably a third of the station, maybe close to half is in Russian. So you have to learn Russian. Right. And I really made it a point to not just learn the technical terms of, you know, that how to work the equipment, but also just how to talk to these guys. And they all speak English. In 2020, they all speak English. In the early days, they were crusty old Soviet fighter pilots. They didn't speak English. So <laughs> the guys that went up on Mir, they, no kidding, had to learn Russian. Right. Um, but, you know, nowadays it, it, uh, it was both ways. But I really made an effort to learn those expressions just to be one crew and not two separate crews. Right. And, and I think people will be surprised to know, to learn, uh, that there is a Russian control center for the space station. Yeah, it's Korolev, and it's in the suburbs of Moscow. So every day you talk to all the different centers. You talk to Tsup Moscow, uh, Moscow, Houston, uh, Huntsville in Alabama is where we do our science from, payload. Uh, there's a control center in M München in Germany. Hmm. Um, it's in Oberpfaffenhofen. So I always joke, I always wanted to call them Oberpfaffenhofen, but they wanted to be called Munich. And then in Japan also, Tsukuba, which is near Tokyo. And Canada has one too. We, we didn't usually talk to them, but there's all these control centers around the world because it's the International Space Station. Right, right. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to sort of dive into some of the questions here. Uh, yeah. uh, somebody wanted to know, how difficult is it to become an astronaut? <laughs> well, it's pretty difficult. Um, you know, every class, there's thousands of applicants and they pick 10-ish. Um, the last thing I did at NASA before I left was help them to go through applications for the new class. There were 18,000. Of course, in the, in, the in the Twitter universe, you know, a lot more people hear about it. A lot of people apply and then you apply online. In the old days, you had to make a stack of paper this thick and mail it in. And so that was a, kind of a natural selection, you know, to weeding out, but there's a lot of people that do it. And is, you know, and many of them are qualified to go through all this work. So there's lots and lots of really good qualified people who would make great astronauts that just don't get picked um, because there's just not enough jobs. There's way more qualified people and there's not enough jobs between the medical weeding out and you do an interview. So they get to know you and they look at your experience and then there's, they got to get the demographics, you know, to work out. There's a lot of hurdles that you have to accomplish and, and get over. Definitely a degree of luck is required. Right. Plus and good he, looks, good looks, obviously. Good, good luck. Good community. Actually uh, being a good communicator, I think is, is one of the the things that they, they certainly uh, select for. And you're doing a great job, I have to say. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, so do you have to be like a physically perfect person? Uh, uh, you're, you come from the fighter pilot side, so I'm assuming that your eyesight is good, or at least it used to be before you went to yeah. space. Um, <laughs> do, do you ever foresee like NASA taking people up because they have disability to study that in a weightless condition? I mean, you know, physical I, criteria? I, I, I hope we do. I think it would be really cool to bring disabled people, you know, maybe that are wheelchair bound or whatever. The, the problem is you have to be able to get in and out of that rocket in an emergency. So whatever your disability is, at least in 2020, you got to be able to get yourself out of a capsule in a hurry. Right. Um, so that that's kind of the limiting factor now. Now the space tourist companies, um, Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic specifically, uh, you know, may be able to do that because it's a much um, it's a much, it's a five minute flight. It's a much quicker experience, but I think that would be really awesome to bring disabled folks into space. I, my eyesight's still good. I don't wear glasses. I don't need glasses. It, I'm really lucky. And I have one eye is a little bit farsighted and one eye is a little bit nearsighted. It's always been that way. And the doctor's like, Terry, people pay thousands of dollars to get that. Cause when you get LASIK done, <laughs> that's what they do. So you can read and see far. Um, and I just naturally have that. So I'm, I'm really blessed. Um, when you come down for your interview, the interview is really a, a week of medical testing. Um, right. And it's a, it's a hour long interview and then a week of medical testing. And we've had guys realize that they're missing a kidney or they do a colonoscopy and they, Dr. B. Hine was his name, Bernard Hine <laughs> and nurse Mona. When I went through that, I'm sitting there, you know, on my hands and knees with Dr. B. Hine and nurse Mona back there 
going, Ooh, ah, look at that. And you know, there, there's a monitor. <laughs> so, um, so got, they, they found stuff like cancer, you know, so right. Right. right, you wouldn't normally get checked out as well as NASA checks you out, but there's been people that are, you know, they, they're probably alive today because they went down for their physical and they found this really rare disease. Well, and there's a very famous story of one of the original Southern astronauts, Deke Slayton, uh, yeah. was prohibited from flying because I think he had a heart arrhythmia, um, uh, some, right. some minor but chronic thing. Right. And he eventually did get to fly in 1975 uh, right. on the Apollo Series test project. So that, right. was, that was good. Um, uh, Maria wants to know, what's the largest human-made things that you can see from space on the ground? And, and in particular, did you ever see the Burning Man event? <laughs> My buddies out in Hollywood are trying to get me to go to Burning Man. Um, and I didn't look for it. I wish I would have known about it. I didn't, you know, I, it wasn't like a thing I was looking for. So that question is really in two parts. It's what human made things can you see during the day and at night? And because the reality is during the day, if you were an alien flying by, you would probably not even notice that there are people on earth unless you knew what you were looking for. But at nighttime, it's a, you know, city lights are everywhere. So city lights clearly at night, you can see um, uh, they're, they're dot. I mean, you know, they're either big cities or they're little dots for small towns. Um, but during the daytime, you can see contrails from airliners flying. Mm. You can see little dots on the ocean. If there's like a big cruise ship going, you can see a wave pattern on the ocean, which is really blew my mind. If the sun's reflecting the Atherogenia, uh, um, the reflection was right. Um, and you can see cities if you know what you're looking for, like London and Montevideo, and you, you'll see a big white uh, concrete. Um, so you can see that. Unfortunately, you can see pollution. Uh, that's a man-made thing over China. I think you can also see it over in India. It was just kind of hazy looking. And I wasn't sure if that was because it's a jungle or if it, it's probably pollution. But in China, it's pollution. It's just a giant brown cauldron where, where they have pollution. Um, so those are kind of the things you can see. A lot of you coal can't see the Great Wall of China. Plant. What's that? There are a lot of coal-powered coal power. Coal fired power plants in China. It has brought hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty, which is good. And it's made a mess, which is bad. So we got to figure out how to make electricity without making that mess. Right, right. Um, uh, an anonymous uh, attendee, maybe for obvious reasons, wants These are the to best. Talk, talk, here, talk a little bit about eating and other bodily functions. <laughs> well, I, did, I, I'll add to that. How often did you get to like uh, take a shower or wash down? Uh, never take a shower. So it's every 13 year old boy's dream, no showers. Um, but you, I would wash down every day whenever you exercise, cause just normal life on the station, you don't need a shower. You're not dirty at all. Right. It's like, it's like being in quarantine. I'm sitting here in air conditioning at my chair. I don't do anything. So I'm fine. But, uh, when you exercise, you're dripping sweat. So you need to clean up. So afterwards you take your clothes off. There's a scene in a beautiful planet. There's, I did a nude scene in beautiful planet. I, I got paid twice what my crewmates did because I did that scene, um, you know, two times zero. Uh, so anyway, you just hot water and a towel. They have these special towels with soap in them and you wash down They rinseless shampoo like they have at the hospital for people who are bedridden. Um, put a little bit of water and wash your hair down and, and it was great. You get totally clean. Don't stink. It wasn't a problem at all. When I got back to earth, it was the first shower I took was painful. I hated it. And Gennady and I were talking about this the other day. He, he agreed. He's like, yeah, showers suck when you get back to earth. The What's first day. What's the food like? And, and do you get to, to have a special, any special selections for you? The, well, on the shuttle, you got to select everything. The shuttle was ridiculous how much they pandered to us. We got a new polo every day. We got to pick every meal. There was way too much food. The shuttle was like embarrassment of riches. The station is not quite like that. So um, they have like a standard menu. There's meat. And it lasts the whole crew for eight days. You don't get to pick. They just put in there, which actually all the food was pretty good. There's a vegetable container. There's fruits and snacks. There's drinks. And after eight days, you throw it away, you open up a new one. And so it's the same thing over and over. But that's not bad. I mean, here on Earth, it's not like you're eating something new for dinner every night of the year. You know, there, you probably have a few things that you make pretty often. So the food was pretty good. Um, you do get to pick a container, they call it a bob. It's like a backpack size thing. 
Um, so I got a, one bob a month and I picked, I got a, some European food, which is really good. I got a couple of those. I, I chose Russian food because I love Russian food and it was variety. It was something different. So I kind of, I, everybody likes variety. It just, it's good to have something different to eat. And then taking care of that food at the end of the um, day. <laughs> so yes, there's a whole chapter about that, um, which is super important actually that of all the things you got to know how to do as an astronaut, that is one of them. Um, so the, uh, the, the, here's the thing to know, uh, airflow. On Earth, you got gravity to make sure everything goes in the right direction. In space, you have fans to make sure everything goes in the right direction. And there's a hose for number one. So if you're a man or a woman, you can put it in the right spot. And uh, there's a can for number two. And uh, you know, you and there's a guillotine. So you open up the guillotine, you go and you close the guillotine. And uh, that that closing the guillotine, opening the guillotine is very important, and closing the guillotine is very important. And there's a funny story in the book about that. Um, uh, Rick wants to know if, uh, he mentions that the next big frontier is Mars and, and the Artemis program is getting rolling and we'll be right. heading back to the, uh, to the moon soon. If you were offered the seat to go to Mars, would you go? So president Kennedy gave his famous speech. Um, we choose to go to the moon, uh, and, uh, this nation commits itself to sending a man to the moon and returning him safely to the earth. So that returning him safely to the earth was my favorite part of Kennedy's speech. Um, so I would definitely go to Mars as long as it was a viable project and it had, you know, there was a reasonable chance of success. Uh, I think that would be, I mean, that would be amazing, right? That would be amazing to go to Mars. Um, but there, there's a lot of things that need to happen. So the Martian, love that book. The book's amazing. The movie is great. Uh, Andy Weir wrote, a, he did one of the blurbs on, on View From Above for me. So uh, the, all the science was interesting. Yeah. He's planting potatoes, right. you know, using the carbon dioxide. But this big Mars ship magically appears and takes the crew to Mars, you know. And that big Mars ship, it's like a minor detail, right? So um, a lot of political things need to happen which lead to fiscal things happening before we can make that big Mars ship. And so that's the, that's kind of one of the big limiting factors. Right. Space radiation is another limiting factor. Why, which is why I think in order for Mars to be viable, um, we need to get there and back in a year and not in three years. If you use a normal rocket that we have today, it's a three year trip. Um, if you develop electric propulsion, which is a way to go faster, uh, you can get there and back, get there, spend a month on the surface and come back in one year. And that's, you know, two years less of radiation exposure. So I, I think that's what we need to do. Right. Um, Diane wants to know if you're familiar with a, a, a um, an art exhibit by former astronaut Jerry Carr and his wife, artist Pat Musick, uh, called Our Fragile Home. You spent a lot of time looking mm -hmm. down at the earth. Are you familiar with that? And, and what was your reaction? <laughs> No, I did not know that. Th thank you. This is two times that somebody has said something that I didn't know. And this is, this is like a unicorn event. Um, wow. I did not know that. I know Alan Bean was a really well-known artist. Um, I've got his book of paintings, Apollo Astronaut. And my classmate, Nicole Stodd, who's a good friend of mine, is also an artist. She does a lot of art. She's like the artistic astronaut. Right. Um, and, she's and, a, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and she's a great painter. So I didn't know about Jerry. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Do you do you stay in touch? You're you're out of the astronaut core now. Yeah. Are, do you stay in touch with all of your uh, your former classmates? And, and the, definitely the not with all of them. But there's there's a few that we stay together. One of my classmates, Samantha, I'm there. sure, because she Samantha, still has to cut her, her her hair. Samantha and Anton, we stay in touch. Um, uh, Gennady, I stay in touch with. In fact, I made a film called One More Orbit. It comes out in a few weeks. Uh, it's a documentary about setting a world record flying around Earth, and Gennady joined us for that. So, um, yeah, Gennady and I definitely stay in touch. Uh, another astronaut buddy of mine I was texting yesterday lives down the street. But you know, for ninety percent of them, no, we kind of everybody everybody's busy in life, and you go your own way. Uh, but there's a handful that I do. And 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 that begs the question. You mentioned one more orbit, which I, I spent some time. It, it's really a fascinating uh, uh, event. Uh, planning to go around the world and going over both poles um, and do it in the least amount of time. This was the clock was ticking, and and 
the pit stops, as always, were, were time critical. Uh, what are you going to do next? In fact, Brian wants to know, uh, would you volunteer to work with Tom Cruise on his upcoming space movie and travel with him to the International Space Station? Yeah, I've always said, people always say, are you going to go back? And I've always said, well, I'd go back to help make a movie. And I think, you know, I, I directed, I was the director for One More Orbit. Uh, I had a really significant role in, in A Beautiful Planet. So yeah, that, that's something that's my passion. Actually, TV and film is kind of what I'm hoping to do next. I, I've got a, a few projects going. Uh, I made this short film that we talked about. So yeah, that, that, that's kind of the, that's what I want to do in the future. Um, I've got a kid's book that um, I'm working on right now. I really want to inspire kids, but I started my own production company. It's called 39A Productions. Um, and my motto for the company is intelligent inspiration, because here's something really important, Kelly. And it's like putting our Republic at risk is it, it, I don't know if it's a lack of education, a lack of trust in science, um, a lack of belief in facts, a, a, a willingness to believe conspiracy theories. It's a real, real problem. Um, and it's tearing the country apart and the world apart. We really need to figure out a way to get people to use wisdom and discernment and judgment and just, you know, trust what they learn from their science teachers in school. Um, because on the one hand, the science stuff is sort of important, but there's a much bigger impact to our society that, you know, if, if we just fracture and we don't trust, you know, some basic things, that's really important. So I, I think through making really cool documentaries or movies that have deeper meanings um, is, in, in my mind anyway, that's the way for me to impact the most people. The One More Orbit was about this adventure setting a world record but it was really about how exploration brings us together. We had uh, 10 different countries on the, of the crew on the airplane, me and Russia and former East German and Polish person and Ukraine, and, and we all got along. So that was really what the movie was about. Long answer, but I want to do TV and film next. No, and, and you know, you, you mentioned the, 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 um, uh, the state, state of science and, and belief in science, you know, we, we have such short attention spans now. You yeah. mentioned when you were growing up, you sat around in the house all summer long. That is not going to happen now. Right. And, uh, and, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. that Science is ever more important. Hey, um, it is. Somebody asked whether, whether you got to take anything up into space with you. And if you did, is any of it on that bookcase behind you? That's a good question. Um, I don't see anything. A lot of the stuff I got after I got back from space. Uh, there's a <laughs> there's a blade from my space shuttle engine. The, one of the compressor blade, the turbines that was spinning, yeah. is up there. So that's one thing. My I have my I have a set of a couple different watches. My Omega X thirty three Speedmaster um, is one of the things that I flew in space. On the on the shuttle, you had a lot of stuff. On the Soyuz, they give you this little small one and a half kilogram bag and you put like jewelry for your family and um, some pictures, family pictures and that kind of thing. I only used up one kilogram. And so my, my trainer, Dima, um, the Russian who trained me how to fly in the Soyuz, I was literally turning it in to go stuff in the Soyuz and go into space. And I said, Dima, I got 500 grams left. Give me your watch. And he took his watch off and gave it to me. And I flew it in space for six months and he had just had a, a baby. And um, anyway, so he, his son got a watch that his dad literally took off at the launch pad to give to me to take into space. That was probably the coolest thing I brought. Mm. Uh, you know, we, we touched on what it's, what, what does one need to do to become an astronaut? <laughs> what, what advice would you give people? And, and in related vein, uh, one of our, our attendees wants to know, were there any teachers in your life that had a special impact and contributed oh. to your success? Yeah. So the real thing, you know, ask, Ask can training. NASA likes to make you feel really good about yourself. So they call you an ask can astronaut candidate. That's about a year and a half. But the reality is it's a lifelong of learning. You know, when I was a kid, uh, I got a telescope. So I taught myself how to use a telescope. Um, I got a camera, a little Konica SLR camera. You had to put the film in and manually wind it. So I taught myself focus and exposure. I had to teach myself all that. I got a TRS-80 computer. So I had to teach myself how to program basic. So this my own journey of doing things on my own was really good for me. It's kind of 
my, my astronaut training was a lifelong thing. The specifics are at NASA, you got to have a technical degree, some type of math or science, you know, medicine. Um, uh, that's the, the bare minimum, but there's lots of other ways to do it. But the reality is it's a lifelong training. And there was a second part of that question. Um, oh, well, um, uh, were there any teachers that- uh, particularly... Teachers, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. Um, Mr. Craig was my math teacher. He was awesome. Chuck Levy was my other math teacher. I did Calc 1 and 2 my junior year and Calc 3 my senior year with him in high school. Um, Mrs. Uh, Herman and Miss Mitchell were my two high school English teachers and I was awful to them. I was terrible. I was, got C's. I never read anything. The only book I've read was uh, Death of a Salesman because it was like that thick and um, everything else. I just read the cliff notes. I was terrible, but they were great. And I'm making a living right now, writing books, literally. Right. That's, how I, that's how I pay the bills. So thank right. you. And, and I, I, I want to just re remind everybody that we're here because uh, <laughs> Colonel Wirtz has, has written this, this great new book, How to Astronaut. It's a new verb in our lexicon. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really a great read. I, I want to thank you so much for being with us this evening. And, uh, you know, I wish you well on your, your future adventures uh, here grounded on planet Earth. Anything you want to say to our audience before we uh, uh, sign off? I wanted to give a shout out to Madame Micah, too, my French high school teacher. Learning French, like literally, changed. I became an astronaut because I did an exchange at the French Air Force Academy. But I, I just hope folks enjoy the book. It's something fun. Um, it's like the antidote to these political hate books that are coming out. <laughs> you know, there's lots of every week there's a new political whatever. Uh, and, and that stuff's super important. I get it. But this is something that it will last much longer than this presidential term. And um, hopefully there's stuff in there that's fun. It's something different. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll laugh and say, wow. So enjoy the enjoy the book. Great. And, it's good and for men and women, have... young and old. Yeah. And, and you, well, read the book now so that you'll be all set for when One More Orbit comes out, which will be soon? Uh, like in two weeks. It's coming out October. So it's, it's just in a few weeks. Great. So, uh, well, uh, again, we've been chatting very comfortably uh, with, uh, with Colonel uh, Terry Wirtz and, and uh, learning all about space and, and what it takes to, to survive up there. And, and we want to thank you again for joining us. Uh, Robert, do you want to jump in here and have any final words or? Uh... So Kelly, I'm fine. I really wanna thank uh, Colonel Wirtz and yourself for doing a wonderful job. And I just encourage folks who are on the call uh, to check their email tomorrow for the feedback survey and a link to the bookstore website. Back nope. to you, Kelly. All right. And so we wanna thank all of you. I, I saw accounts uh, here on our Zoom session as high as like uh, close to 90 and uh, probably a cast of thousands on Facebook. And, and I apologize that we didn't get to all the questions. There were many, many questions. Uh, we could go on, but we won't, I'm sorry. Uh, so <laughs> with that, uh, Colonel, uh, thank you again for joining us and uh, uh, we will sign off and uh, hope to see you again. Thanks for your work at Sky and Telescope, Kelly. My pleasure. Was... Yes. Okay, see you guys. Thanks for having me. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>